Hello, I'm Stephen Bolt. I'm the unit coordinator for measuring and predicting part one. And this is the Blackboard page that you'll see when you start the course. The first folder, you can see you've got several folders that make up the course. We go to the first, aims and objectives of measuring and predicting part one. These are the items. It's worth noting that you can expand these see what's in them by clicking on these arrows on the right hand side. It's very useful to close them up because it allows you to see the overall structure. So just be aware of these. So you can see there's a table of contents most clearly when you've got these closed up and then if you want to see what's in them then open them out. This is just a short introductory video to cover the aim of measuring and predicting part one. The aim, as it says, is to prepare you to carry out an independent research project by defining a general process for research and then teaching general skills related to measuring and predicting pollutant mobility and transformation. So we need to begin somewhere and a reasonable question to ask is why are we here? By here, we mean doing a postgraduate degree in environmental science. And where we are is at a university. And I think a very important thing for you to consider, and you need to actually consider the way that you are going to learn. As postgraduates, um, it's unlike being an undergraduate uh, in that you're even more self-directed and you will consider the way that you learn and why you are doing this. You've made a very clear decision to come back to university and to take on further study. So it's worth thinking quite hard about what we're doing and how we're going to do it. So you're at a university, what do universities actually do? They have to generate income in order to exist and the outputs they produce in order to generate income are really two things, research and the research outputs are largely academic journal articles that fill the libraries and that are useful to the wider community we hope and also teaching and the output from that is people with degrees. So they're the things that generate income. That's what we do at university. You're at a university. How does that fit with you? You're doing a degree that has a research component and it has a taught component. In the next section, when we look at the intended learning outcome of being able to define what is research and what is good research, will consider this tension between research and teaching in much more detail and it's particularly important to you because you are undertaking a course which has a, a taught component but it leads to a research component and we need to think about what it means to do research and what that means for your degree. We'll do that in the next all I want to do is just to highlight some tensions in learning. You have a learning process, you've come to learn, and there are tensions in learning. And that means balancing things. And the broadest tension really is between finding solutions for current problems or finding solutions for future problems. So clearly there's an efficiency in learning to solve a current problem, you know what that problem is, you know what's required to solve it, and they're the things that you should learn about. That tends towards being training, so it's solving for a more particular problem. Whereas if you're trying to teach people to be general problem solvers, so that's trying to come up with a general way of solving problems that might be useful for different sorts of problems and problems that aren't known yet then to achieve that might be regarded as something more as an education so that's the difference between training and education training is easier to deliver in large part because the people that you're delivering training to know that they've been trained know what the problem is, know what you're trying to show them, know if they can solve it after being trained, 
it's much more direct. Education, it's much harder to deliver and that might fall much more into generic skills that are transferable. Again, another one of the tensions between depth and breadth, you can see that the depth would be learning to solve a particular problem. You can afford to invest time and resource into the particular skills in depth that are needed to solve a particular problem. However, should there be a different sort of problem, it may not be very useful. So there's this balance between depth and breadth. This applies to all sorts of learning. However, for environmental science, what's particularly important to remember is that environmental science problems or environmental problems are almost by definition multidisciplinary. We're trying to understand the behaviour of the environment and the environment extends from things down at a molecular level of scientific understanding all the way up to societal changes and behavioural economics and economics and psychology. So it means that there are a huge number of variables and it spans across a wide range of disciplines. So for environmental problems, breadth is particularly important and perhaps the definition of environmental scientist might be somebody that is particularly useful at dealing with problems broadly and having an overview. Ideally, you'd like to have the depth of knowledge in every aspect, but it's impossible to do that for the environment. So perhaps a definition of an environmental scientist might be somebody that is particularly educated to recognise the links between subjects. Given the particular importance of recognising links between subjects in order to be a uniquely qualified person as an environmental scientist, it's important that you recognise links between the subjects that you're studying during your MSc. And you'll notice that the next item on the Blackboard page is actually links. At this level it's links to the other units. Um, unfortunately I can't do the other units with you uh, so it's up to you to make sure you see the connections between these units. They are closely connected and the connections are explained here but you should as you're going through doing these units not treat them in isolation but see the links, as ultimately that's the value that you're going to bring to your employment or your research as an environmental scientist. So start to develop that ability to recognise the links from this point on. Within the unit, I've also got hyperlinks um, between items. As it says on the Blackboard site, we can't do anything except follow the content in the linear order presented to start with. We need to work through it together in one way. But once you've seen the material on the course, then when you review it, you can use the hyperlinks to jump between things that are related. And the most important thing is for you to see the relationships and the hardest thing. But that's what's going to make you special. So I'm considering these tensions in learning and also how they relate particularly to environmental science and environmental problems, then you can go ahead and do the short set of practice questions which are presented as a blackboard test. Also, they're listed on the next slide.